Well, no, at least. A bullet hit the lower shutter. There's a big hole. The bullet fell on the sofa, but fortunately it didn't burn, and we still can sit on it. The director of a Kramatorsk manufacturing plant tells about how the war has affected his business. The plant is located next to an airfield, which the Ukrainian military has used as a base of operations. Even the most difficult days, when the city was occupied by Russian-backed separatists, the government managed to hold on to that strategic point. The city still bears the marks of those times, bullet holes, scorched sofas, and holes in ceilings. This is the tail of a 120mm mortar that broke through the ceiling and fell down here. There was a hole in the ceiling, but we patched it and continued to work. But the window will stay as it is. The company's director believes that it is important that people are reminded about the fragility of life. Why are we fighting for the Ukrainian flag, not for the Russian one? After all, they say, it was better in Russia, and many of the fools believed it. They said that they would feed us, and well, sure. But how can you understand that the only way to truly live and work is by defending your independence? Kramatorsk is now a safe city under the full control of the Ukrainian government, but the feeling of war lingers in the air. The police department is guarded by people in military uniforms and armed with machine guns. Soldiers are always seen on the street, ready to either defend the city from a Russian-backed offensive or to return to the front lines. In June of 2014, militants fired at these houses from their positions on Karachin Mountain, which was under their control at the time. Locals say that the fighting was especially heavy here as the separatists hurriedly withdrew from Slovyansk and Kramatorsk and retreated to Donetsk. When we returned in the morning to see our houses, we saw all the balconies were damaged and fallen on the ground. A rocket hit the roof and it was destroyed. The city was liberated in the summer of 2014. However, many houses were badly damaged and the school was destroyed. Today, the traces of these events have been removed by repair crews. But the scars of the battle will forever linger in the memories of the locals. We've survived everything. Tell me, when will this war end? How many people will suffer? Why does nobody do anything? Well, tell me, please. <laughs> Women are singing the national anthem and shouting slogans. Every morning, the Kramatorsk bees get to work. They are a group of women volunteers whose workshop is located in a basement. They do not sit idly at home. They are doing what they can for their country. Today, they are visited by artillerymen stationed in nearby Dobrofilia. The guys want to eat. Can we offer them to eat some soup? Sit down. The women cook at home, making big portions to give to the soldiers. They also collect donations for them. Sometimes, other local inhabitants join in on their activities. The women are very proud of the camouflage netting which they make themselves. They say it is specially designed and has magical properties that can protect soldiers. Sometimes, enemy shells land within five meters of a serviceman, but they still survive. Initially, we only made the camouflage netting. Later, we started to sew the suits for them. We have made 156 of these suits. These women make one and a half thousand knots a day. It can take them four days to make one suit. People bring them bags from all over Ukraine to make artillery shelters. IDPs from occupied Donbass are also among the volunteers. Each of them has their own story. Olha moved to Kramatorsk after her husband was released by the militants. He was imprisoned after being informed on by pro-Kremlin collaborators. When her husband had been freed, he began serving on the front, and her sons moved away from Donetsk. My husband went to defend our country, first in a volunteer battalion, and now on contract with the regular army. When I came to our father-in-law, a former policeman, he went to the Donetsk People's Republic. Someone told him about us, and he said that our family was now on a blacklist, and if my sons come, they will be shot dead. In 2014, the separatists murdered a 16-year-old Kramatorsk native, Stepan Chubenko. He was fond of football and wrote patriotic poems. One of them is published in the anthology, Donbass, Come to Your Senses. After he was found, witnesses said that he had been taken to Donetsk, where he was brutally beaten, tortured by three men, and then shot. Five bullets were found in his body. Other patriotic NGOs have organized themselves around the Kramatorsk bees, including children's groups. A small museum was put together in one of the workshop's rooms. The museum displays paintings, models of weapons, and colorfully decorated artillery shells. We've painted hundreds of shells. We give them as gifts and also sell them. We also make items out of beads. Girls buy the materials to make the items, for example. They buy hats, and we can paint them. At the workshop, 
volunteers come to tell stories about the Heavenly Hundred, soldiers from the anti-terrorist operation, and local inhabitants who have been killed as a result of the hostilities. You can come to see photos of destroyed buildings in the center of the city. All the same, the residents of Kramatorsk hope that the war will never come to their town again.